Hi friend, Niklas here. Welcome to another episode of the Your Audio Solutions podcast, where it's my mission to find the tools and methods from the people that inspire you so you can apply their knowledge to your own life and work. On the show today, we have award-winning trumpeter, keyboardist, singer, producer, writer, Tony Klausi. And he's such a, he was such a nice and chill guy, and it was really nice spending an hour or so talking to him, and I hope you will enjoy our conversation as well. Uh, and also, definitely check out his music. He has a new album coming out in January, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to listen to some of his tracks from the album. It's really cool, and if you're into jazz and just good songs, definitely check that album out that comes out in January, and also check out his previous stuff already on Spotify, YouTube, uh, wherever you're listening to music. Um, but pleasure talking to him, and I hope you will enjoy our conversation too. And what else has been going on? Um, been watching the new Frank Zappa documentary. I don't know if you you have seen it. It's um, what's it called? Frank Zappa. It's called Zappa, maybe. It's on Amazon Prime. Uh, really cool documentary. I didn't know. I mean, I've been listening to Frank Zappa a lot, and I love his guitar playing. Some of his songs, you know, take it or leave it. But some of his albums are really, really good. Especially the apostrophe, shake your booty, just garage is pretty cool. Uh, Overnight sensation is pretty cool too. But his guitar playing has always been awesome. Um, but I didn't know he was uh, he was so what's it called that he slept around so much. I mean, even though he was married, I thought he was a stable uh, what's it called family man. But turns out he was on the wilder side, <laughs> which I didn't know. Uh, but if you haven't seen the documentary. Definitely check it out. It's really, really good on Amazon Prime at the moment and other uh, on-demand websites out there. Um, but also before we get, in, get into the interview with Tony, if you want uh, interviews like these um, before the public and a chance to ask up-and-coming guests questions, check out check out the Audio Tribe. Hard to pronounce for some reason. Check out the Audio Tribe. There's a link in the description below. Uh, just enter your name and email address and you have joined the Audio Tribe email list. Uh, it's completely free, of course. And if you do, you get um, interviews before the public and a chance to ask up and coming guests questions and much more stuff that I hope we can do in the future. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, please, please hit subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe there as well and Spotify, leave a rating. And all that stuff, the channel is growing slowly but steady. And that's thanks to you. So I really appreciate your support. Uh, but that's it. Let's get into the interview with Tony Glauci. So please enjoy. Where are you at in the world right now? Are you? Uh, London. London. Wow. Yeah. You're in New York, right? Yeah. At the, at the moment, I'm actually in Portland, Oregon, where I grew up. But maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah, sure, man. Yeah, we'll, why we'll why are you in... To start there, why are you in Oregon? Is it because of the pandemic? Right. I've been in New York almost all the year. Um, but I came out to Portland for the holidays, just for Thanksgiving, Christmas, just to be with my parents and some of my siblings who are out here. So I grew up here. Uh, we lived in California for a brief period of time but mostly in Oregon all my life until I moved to New York and it's nice I'm still working out here finishing so I have this album coming out in January right when it all comes crashing down but I also have another album that it has a completely different direction that's almost done so I'm finishing that and also doing some online teaching as well I just have some students on Skype and I used to be teaching quite a few in person that have now moved to Skype uh that's keeping me busy. Nice. So it's mostly, mostly production and teaching is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm doing right now. I'm not a musician anymore. I'm a right. <laughs> you know, but, it's like, I mean, that, that makes sense, man. I mean, like for myself, you know, like doing live gigs has been essentially no gigs, you know, for the last I don't know how many months it is since end of March, I guess. Uh, and who knows when it's gonna open back up again? You know, it's crazy. I heard somebody say that the guy who's in charge of the you know, team who's finding the vaccine, they said that he 
felt that by this time next year, about November, December next year, we oh, yeah. would be living close to how we were before, but it would take that long to get everything back. But you know what? We're never really going to get it back. The Jet, one of the clubs in New York, just closed. Hmm. They just announced they were closing yesterday or today. Like, <laughs> like for good? Like for good. Wow. They just, that's it. Financially, it's not going to work. Um, having to pay, I mean, I can't even imagine what they're paying um, to lease that space in hmm. Midtown, right? Hmm. Financially, it's not going to work, so they're they're done. And I think we're going to see that happen even more in the next year um, mm. before things get back. And so, like I said, are we really going to get back? I don't That's it. We can't go back in time. We're not going to get back the sense of culture on any level that we had before. Mm. I think more, more than just places closing down, I think the, the saddest thing is just what it's doing to everybody's mental and emotional health and how it's trapping us inside and keeping us you know locked on our phones and i'm doing everything i can to get off of that actually mm -hmm. uh, being super conscious of that we're going to see a big shift things were already you know you can order food right to your apartment right you can mm -hmm. order groceries you can do everything get amazon to send you anything you can already see anything you want on netflix it's all right there on a little device and even more of that businesses are going to come out of this things that were half online, half in person are just going to shift over. And it's going to be tough for us. It will, man. I mean, that... the thing is about, you know, spending all our times on, on Netflix and whatnot. I mean, that's something that's been, uh, start, that's something I started to feel now, like, you know, it's getting a bit too much watching stuff, you know, because there's nothing else, or there is other stuff to do, I guess. Like, I mean, if you're creative, you can do other stuff, but, It's not very easy to get into the rut of, okay, we can't go out. Let's just watch something. And you're just like, what the hell, you know, <laughs> it gets boring. <laughs> so that's it. That's where we're going to stay is, is what I think. It's mm -hmm. not just losing the jazz standard in other clubs, but we're going to have people becoming more and more comfortable with that. And so people like you and me that play, yeah, okay. I mean, maybe we're just going to be doing a little more teaching and a little more producing and i like the thing on the bright side I, I, i'm not assuming that it's going to be that dark <laughs> right. but uh it's a very real thing that we're facing and like i said earlier being super conscious about my phone use i want to be very proactive as this thing starts to lift and i want to do my best to get out and get playing again hmm. um where it's not compromising on my my worth or my values as a musician i think a lot of people have been playing For me, I mean, I've been hearing about it. I've been seeing it in New York. People are playing for little to no pay right now because, hey, it's a gig. I have the time. I'm thinking, man, see, that's another problem that we're going to be facing, especially as freelancers. People are going to be now used to, well, restaurants are kind of just giving you a meal and a drink. There are some places that are treating musicians like that. It was already bad before, but now they're just, well, hey, we don't have the money, but if you want to play and want to get a meal, play mm -hmm. for some tips, people are like, yeah, I'll do it. Now, how are they going to just all of a sudden get back to, to paying musicians? Mm. They're going to be used to that, right? You see what I mean? So we're kind of seeing it happen. We're, what are we, seven, eight months in? Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to get out of that because things are going to yeah, change. But, but something I, my, my, my girlfriend told me today, which was absolutely crazy, was uh, BBC, I think it was. There's a, there's a, I don't know if you have it in the US, but it's a sh popular show called uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Maybe you have like Dancing with the Stars, something like that, you know? Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. there's a band, right? And yeah. apparently, they're not paying the musicians to play on that show or something. Or there was some sort of spin-off show of that show, but still on BBC. And they're not paying those musicians. And I was like, what the hell? And I would, I don't know any musicians who would take that deal. And especially BBC, they should, they should pay. I mean, they have the money. That's they have the money. Well, <laughs> the thing is, there's always going to be a... You know, There will always be somebody that'll take that opportunity because, hey, I get to put on a be seen by millions of people on TV. So, yeah, I'll do that. I made a point two years ago, the beginning of 2019, I decided, and I'd always had the fortune of not having to do a lot of work within music that I didn't enjoy, but there was enough of it, um, just the occasional 
wedding, you know, kind of corporate gig or gig where I felt like the music wasn't right, the band wasn't right, the whole thing. And I'm just thinking, life is too short to be playing this kind of music ever. So I made it a point, beginning of 2019, to just play the music I wanted to play. Not super selfishly, I'm playing a lot of other people's music, but just music that's really a good fit for me. Because when the music works for me, I work for the music, and it's a, it's a feedback loop. The music, it's explosive, that energy of, of like joy and love. I never really found that uh, with a couple dozen wedding gigs I did, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, at the beginning of 2019, I said, okay, this is easy now. The only you know the only criterion for taking the gig is 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 the music good right right of course usually good music comes with good people Hmm. uh not always but most of the time when the music's really happening it's because the band has a certain energy too right but here we are so hungry now after eight months of not playing it's like i'm already feeling that temptation it's like oh wow maybe i would do this or that thing right but we got to be really aware of that and not mm-hmm. not let it happen not let that rip us out of our 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 peace and joy that we can have as as artists right that's a hard thing to cultivate really i'm sure you know <laughs> feel the yeah. same way it's like there's so many distractions and so many opportunities that are not worth really pursuing mm-hmm. and anyway so it's been a year of of less i think for myself definitely and i think for most people around me and that's okay Mm-hmm. That's that's why I'm concluding. There's nothing wrong with that. Get yeah, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, that that's that's the main thing. It's out of our control. You know, which is yeah. both a blessing and a curse, I guess. Because uh, it's nice when it's not our fault that we don't have any gigs. <laughs> you know, at least that's what I think. Because <laughs> then it doesn't mean it, you're too yeah. lazy or anything. You know? It'd be nice if there was some. I mean, I guess there was imp- unemployment in New York for a bit. I don't know how it was in the UK, but mm-hmm. there there was some sort of like the government did care a little bit. Oh, hey, you guys don't have work, like you know. But but that ended in in July right. or whatever. Anyway, they were really good so, here about that, actually. Right. Yeah, I mean, we just got a new grant. Uh, yeah, this week, you know, uh, at what? least I could apply for this week again. Uh, so it's been what? consistently. And this is the third. Is it the third? Yeah, I think it's the third grant. Um, and there's another one coming next year, which is not bad at all. You know, UK has done a really good job supporting the self-employed. Um, some people have fallen through the cracks, unfortunately, but other than that, it's been, they've been pretty good towards us. Pretty good, yeah. Mm-hmm. There, have been, there have been some grants here. Um, Louis Armstrong Foundation ah. did a million dollars. They did a thousand, thousand dollar grants. Wow positions uh in new york so that was great and really i mean i have nothing to complain about i've i've had a not a quite quite a pleasant year like i said just with the teaching and the, and the producing everything slowing down mm. i do miss playing it's okay i've had a few opportunities to perform i was in mexico for six weeks making a couple records and i did two shows there and they were really fun and nice. they were they were at maximum capacity they had like a limit of like thirty percent or thirty three percent or whatever, so there were you know forty people in the in the venue, but it was really fun and a nice taste of the past, except that it had this i don't know if this was just in my head, I was just projecting this or if this was really how it was, but it had this f- sort of melancholy feeling about it in the air in those performances because everybody's kind of on edge and a little masked up, and the whole thing is just different it's not quite the same. people are hungry to hear the music and get outside but that's another thing that, that may take years to sort of fix itself is just how we all feel in public together. Mm-hmm. Not only is stuff open, but when it is open and we're there, it's just like now we're not shaking hands, which I'm cool with. I don't want to shake hands. Mm-hmm. It's like just everything is going to have that subtle change. And that's mm-hmm. cool. That's human history. You know? Yeah, definitely. Just, I mean, just keep our head. Do, do you have a strategy to go to get back to gigging and stuff? Or. Not super concrete, but like I said, I, I've been conscious of it. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to say yes and no to the right things in the last eight months. And, and I, what I want to do, because I have this album coming out in January, mm-hmm. um, so I want to find a few opportunities that really feel like the best place to present the music. Um, and I have another album that will come out hopefully next year uh, nice. in the warm months at some point. It's, like I said earlier, it's a very different thing. Mm. Uh, but I, w- I want to find the right place for that music to be performed. I might try to 
rig a tour um, in in a couple of the places that I feel like I have a stronger audience, like maybe in Mexico or Spain or on the West Coast. Um, so I'll see what I can do. There's a couple other bands that I play in that I have a little bit of hope <laughs> on their calendars, right? It's like, oh, yeah, we have some COVID clauses and things kind of worked in. So we'll see what happens. I think there will be some performances. Nice. feels like that. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to try to go 100% because I think we're just going to be, if we have that expectation, we're going to be met with mm-hmm. disappointment over and over again. So it's it's about being a minimalistic in, in, in my approach as far as booking my own stuff. I'm also looking for um, finding, I'm kind of in the process of, of seeing if I can kind of put together a team for mm-hmm. what I do. You know, like, not being my own manager agent Mm -hmm. booking everything kind of navigating everything myself and and seeing if it's possible right now in my career to do some delegation and kind of bring people on um it might be a little early for that but it feels just i'm trying to be sensitive to the way things are moving and feeling and, and it really feels like it's moving in that direction so we'll see what that looks like for this coming year as well um but how how would you go about doing doing that? The putting the team together, just bringing in. I mean, people have told me in the past, like maybe the first person to bring in would be a manager. Mm-hmm. So just finding somebody who's really up to speed on what you're doing and really passionate about what you're doing and can really advocate for you. And from there, they will often bring in other people to work. But I mean, like getting kind of like a family of people that I can work with as far as videos and photos and design and, you know, tour. Like I have these friends and contacts in other countries that I just simply don't use. Mm -hmm. And I don't, not that we want to be using our friends, but it's like, I don't even say like, Hey, can you help me like get this thing together? I kind of just do everything myself. And I, I think it's time to, just to <laughs> broaden my horizons in that sense so again there's not a super concrete plan there but 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 that's the idea it's just to i want to employ people too that's the other thing is like i always like working with a variety of people because it brings a different flavor specifically in the music of course it brings different flavors in to what you're doing and i think on a broader scale in in a career um, when you're doing everything yourself you're 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 stuck in your own head and and you're not actually reaching your potential because there's there's nobody else plugging into all of their Roots, mm-hmm. they're they're huge network of of connections to grab what they can for you and, and make it a you know a, a mutually beneficial like a collectively beneficial kind of operation. I don't like to think of it as a business, so I said operation instead. How come people always what, say, "Oh, what a business." They say, "Oh, yeah, a musician is just like a business." Not even not even close. A musician is a musician. A musician right. is more like a philosopher or like a. I I sometimes tell my students like a. Like, um, oh, what do I say? Some like like we're like guardians or like warriors and we're like spiritual warriors. You know what I mean? That's not a business. Come on, mm-hmm. we're musicians. So I don't want to. We got to make business moves sometimes. But I myself, as a human, as a, as a musical entity, I'm not a business. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not making myself clear. Mm-hmm. So and maybe it's a fine line between a business and a, and a collective or a, uh, having an operation. Right. But we yeah, can definitely. all have operations right we we need to have some sort of flow to our our work and our business if you will but mm. we're not a business i'm not a business right. you know just bieber is not a business but right. he's an artist he has a collective of people he has a he has a whole operation that's going mm. and yeah they've created a brand they make business moves mm. there's there's a business element to mm. selling music but i have a whole thing on selling music too like mm. really I don't think that music should be sold. I think music is one of those priceless, eternal, you know, again, spiritual things like just wisdom and knowledge and storytelling and fairy tales and all that. You can't really put a price on that. You can't really sell that. We're trying to. We try to box it up and... Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting interesting take, man. I mean, if I understand you correctly, is you as the person, Tony, the musician, you are not a business you are the person making music you're the musician but 
there might be elements around you that are business to drive your career forward, right? Is that, is that correctly yeah. understood? Or? Exactly, to help bring the music to the people, really, mm. because I, I put myself as like a channel between divine inspiration, and I don't believe in God. Mm. That, that's not what it is. It's like I believe in it, that I'm a channel or a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a means of conducting some sort of musical inspiration from a divine entity, if you, if you want to look at it like that, or just the divine, or just musical. It's all that ethereal mm. stuff that we don't really understand. Music has that thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just one of many, like I said, warriors, if you will. It's like, <laughs> it's funny, I don't know why, maybe we'll have to think about why I'm choosing the word warriors, because it, warriors kind of implies that there's some sort of battle to be fought. In many ways, I think music does fight a battle of, of good over just the, the pull of human evil in a way mm -hmm. right but mm -hmm. however you want to look at it i'm just one of many musicians in between that spiritual divine realm right conducting that music between that realm and the people that are listening and yeah we need businesses we need spotify we need things that are business like to mm -hmm. package up our product and get to the people um but is that what but, drove you to 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 jazz like was that the strongest connection you had with that spiritual feeling or spiritual, whatever you want to call sure. it? Sure. I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of different music, but it was really just coming out of jazz and, and R&B in particular, right? Mm -hmm. It was just black music, black American music through and through all the genres that you, that you want to, you know, throw out. That's what I grew up listening to. I mean, amongst my early influences are Stevie Wonder, first and foremost, Aretha Franklin, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Paul Simon. Mm. That's a white guy. We love Paul Simon, but mm. his music came out of you know what I mean. Like oh, we 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 know this. All all of this music came out of really like folk and blues and all that black culture in the South, right? Mm. Starting with jazz and morphing into everything that it morphed into. Um, but I. I what else do we have playing all the time at home? Glenn Miller Orchestra, Duke Ellington. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were early influences. So none of that was super trumpet heavy until I had an uncle give me, when I started playing the trumpet, I had an uncle give me uh, Kind of Blue. So right. I started listening to Miles Davis. I was cool with it. My older sister was playing saxophone and she'd always have Charlie Parker playing and she'd be transcribing. And so I'd listen to Red Rodney or Dizzy or you know whoever was on those records. And like I said, I was mildly interested mm. but what really got me trumpet and got me transcribing and got me into jazz was my friends in high school being like man you sound like i was always practicing classical trumpet they're like you sound good but like you're not you know you don't know what you're doing when you're when you're trying to take a solo in the jazz band so when i was 16 i, I finally just got into it because my friends hit me to the right records and i started listening to chet baker and lee morgan and some of winton's albums and freddie hubbard and i started transcribing all the all the heavies and fell in love. And that, that's where I've been largely um, for the last 10 years. Mm. But uh, growing up a piano player and a singer, sort of casually playing both and then eventually really studying piano, um, I, I felt like my early sound, if you will, like I was seven years old, I hardly had a sound. But like uh -huh. what I really <laughs> did was kind of singer songwriter, piano playing, singing, writing little ditties and and whatever and and i feel like i'm finally bringing that element back into my music so what you'll see with this album in january when it all comes crashing down you'll see um there's a lot of more influences from that vein of of like i was saying singer songwriter mm. uh, i mean it, it'll have like an influence it'll sound almost like a musical right i'll just put it that way. awesome some, some of that music sound like a musical res my other records have been much more like jazz trumpet if you will and then the record that follows will sound much more songwriter-esque and, and have those more of those Stevie, Paul Simon influences just of, you know, tunes, a song, mm -hmm. the lyric, and all that. Um, but it's, it's, and like, it's, it's cool with the, yeah. the, the, the jazz thing because I never, I've always been dabbling with jazz as in terms of do I like it, do I, do I not like it? I've always been in between. I think it depends on what I listen to, but I never really fell in love with it as much as uh, rock or funk or stuff mm. like that, you know. Um, yeah. 
so it's always been very it's been a I always try like consistently I try a new record like I listen to um, Kind of Blue and a whole lot of other records but they never they connect me with that way that it did with you so it's it's just funny how we can you know have this different interpretation I guess you know what resonates change, changes with time changes mm -hmm. with how much you know about the music how much you know about yourself and what, what was it with those solos that, that made it you know, connect with you specifically. Oh, like specifically trumpet solos or things. Yeah, the one like yeah. you said, you started transcribing like Chet Baker and stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, it's it's so fun. I get to write uh, for uh, there's a there's a jazz magazine that is going to have me do a, a two page spread about like the ten songs that are on my like life playlist, if you will. Awesome. And. So I've been thinking about that in the last week. Um, I put, because I'm trying to capture my whole life for the <laughs> 10 songs, which is, wow, that's a, that's an adventure. It's been super cool it to is. reflect <laughs> on that. Well, what are the, so I'm not going to give all of it away, but I'll give, because there's only three, um, quote, jazz songs, if you will. Uh, the rest of them are, like, there's a Paul Simon track on there. There's a Stevie track. Um there's songs by contemporary artists and I'll leave the rest, you know, for, for when it comes out. But mm -hmm. the three, you know, to spoil it now, the three trumpet solos that I put on there were uh, a Freddie solo on You and the Night and the Music, but Bill Evans' version on his album Interplay, which I think is a 10 out of 10. Wow. Or a 7 out of 7. I think there's seven tracks on it. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, man, what a band. <laughs> It's like, just it doesn't get better than that band. Bill yeah, wanted to just put together his his favorite cats all on on each instrument. It's like Philly Joe on drums and Jim Hall on guitar, and Freddie's solos on all these tracks are amazing. But the first track is "You and the Night and the Music," and I remember when I first heard that I was sixteen. And I just thought, well, that's just perfection. I didn't really get why. I just I heard it all. I felt it all, and I continue to play along with that solo ten years later. Mm. So that's one of them. Um, like I said, the whole album, everybody on that record is just, ooh. Nice. I, I got to check it out, just man. The, it's just the best. Listen to the track Interplay, too, mm -hmm. the, the title track. It's just a whole vibe. Man, those guys were really into <laughs> Yeah. Nice. So that album, um, let's see. Then I put, I think, and I'm saying I think because I'm, I'm, I can still change it, but I'm going to put... I Double Dare You by Louis Armstrong. Now, Louis Armstrong is, without a doubt, my favorite trumpet player. I just think that he has everything. How come? That, uh, <laughs> he's got everything in his sound. He's got everything in his, in his time feel. Every single quarter note, every single thing he plays is melodic, and it is soulful, and it is joyful. He is just magnificent. Mm. So, um, Louis Armstrong, I Double Dare You is is on there and that to me is a no perfect solo i just i'll just say that <laughs> right, right, right. um i can make a list of, of 20 solos that you know that i'd want to put on that yeah, that yeah, play yeah. But, uh and then the third one let's see who did i put on there i feel like i should know huh um <laughs> maybe it comes back to you later yeah, it'll, it'll come back to me later. Have you ever heard but of anyway. Pharaoh Sanders? Is that how you pronounce it? Pharaoh Sanders, yeah, fantastic. I just I just listened to him the other week or two weeks ago, and I never listened, listened to him before. Um, and I found this track. I, I forgot the name of the track, annoyingly. It's kind of a long track, but that track was like... Sa it sa that track sounded like something... Almost like someone putting music to uh, anxiety. You know, it just... Something just kept becoming worse and worse and worse. Everything, the whole music scene, whatever you want to call it, like the the, 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 the the drums and the trumpet, they just fell into this thing, like chaos. Oof, I don't know exactly what it was, but it just sounded so, yeah, so Do anxious. You know Do you know what album that was? I, it's, it's some early album. Uh, I tried to I tried to find it today, but I couldn't find it again. I was like, damn. But it was very very um anxious filled or chaos filled sound and 
and and composition of that song. If you remember, <clears throat> you should email because I want to check that out. Yeah, definitely, man. I'll, I'll get back to looking after this our interview here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me. So let me finish my list though really quick mm -hmm. uh, with like other solos. These aren't going to make it in that playlist of ten tracks, but um, like other solos I love of of Louis Armstrong would be. The first one I ever transcribed was Cornet Chop Suey. And that I had heard when I was, I think, 12 or 13. I remember one of my, my teachers hipping me to this track because it had all these amazing yeah. arpeggios. Cornet Chop Suey is on there. Potato Head Blues is on there. Hotter Than That. Basin Street Blues. Strutting With Some Barbecue. Oh, man. There's this one. He has a bunch of different versions of this. And these are mostly original compositions. That's what's cool. People always think of Louis Armstrong as just... A trumpet player, and I think a lot of people think of him as a you know a cover artist, right? Mm -hmm. Playing popular tunes, but the guy wrote a lot of tunes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, he's an original artist, not just an original sound, an original concept musically, uh, as far as improvising goes. But you know, mm -hmm. the the tunes are great. Um, so those are those are all on my list. I was into, I had a huge Clifford Brown phase. I transcribe all the things you are, and Joy Spring, um, and when I transcribe something and I learn it note for note. I don't often write it down. I'm just trying to get it sounding exactly like the record. Um, it's been harder for me in the last few years to transcribe things. I don't do it as often, and if I do, it's usually just Louis Armstrong or Fats Navarro. That's another guy on my list. I have these right. uh, two cuts. I have Index is one one song, and then Fat Girl. These are just great solos. When I transcribe something note for note, because I'm listening to all kinds of things and really digging other solos of Louis Armstrong or Freddie or whoever it is, but when I transcribe something, it's because I really feel like it has everything, at least in its own way, it has everything I would want to see in a solo. Because when you're going to play over and over again with it, that, that's going to hit your playing. That's going to mm -hmm. stick with you. And so I'm a little picky uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to playing these full solos. But let's see, what else is on here? I have Miss Parker of KC, which is a, has a solo by Booker Little, right. one of my favorites. Um, there's another one, Strollin', which is on a Horace Silver album. This is a Blue Mitchell solo. And then I have Happy Met Miss Jones, Chet Baker. Mm -hmm. I have two solos by Nicholas Payton. Off, uh, one of them is Drifting, one of them is One Finger Snap. I have a couple solos by my man Jay Thomas. This is a friend of mine okay. in Seattle. Uh, one of the most gorgeous sounds and articulations and time feels. So anyway, those are some of my, there's other people on this list, but those are just some of my full transcriptions, just to give you a sense of like, mm -hmm the trump music if you will <laughs> that's really yeah, yeah. affected um but honestly even through all those years of transcribing I, what i was mostly listening to would be that pop r&b singer songwriter kind of land you know like aretha stevie and something like jamie Cullum. you probably know who jamie Cullum is yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. british british singer and, and, and pianist mm -hmm. He has a couple albums, like Catching Tales and The Pursuit. Those two records are just chock full of amazing tunes. Mm. Like, the songs are just spectacular. And then, of course, the way he sings them was just... <laughs> he's got the most colorful voice on the planet right mm -hmm. now. I mean, maybe amongst the most colorful voices. He's just... Oof! His sound, right? And then he plays... Nobody plays the piano like that. I mean, it's just cool, right? Yeah, I, I, need to, love... I need to get into his music more. I haven't really done that, but I've heard great things about him. He's a spectacular artist. I think he really has all the all the things, and really in his own way. Um, you know, he has he's clearly been influenced by Herbie Hancock and Nina Simone right. and Stevie and all the heavies, right? Mm -hmm. But he's got his own sound. That's the most beautiful thing. Exactly. Um, you know, Winton, Winton is the same way. Winton Marcellus on the trumpet. It's like He's got such his own sound, yet you hear all that history and all that greatness that he has heard and studied, and that's been a, become a part of him. Um, yeah, it's, it's super fascinating, man. I mean, I, I got to ask you this because uh, I was talking to um, uh, guitarist, uh, jazz artist uh, Oz Noy like a few months ago, a month ago or something. Uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a prominent jazz guitarist. Um, yeah. And we were talking about songwriting and and uh, writing music, right? And he said, he said there's a difference between writing music and writing songs. Um, where are you in that in that um, aspect of do you, do you feel like you're writing music? Do you feel like you're writing songs, or do you feel like 
they're both the oh. same. No, they're not the same. Right. I think a song, if you think about like a leader, or however you say that, the German, the old, you know that what was that? What's that word? They, like I, they were when they were um, writing those songs, or they I want to look up the word. I want to know what it is. I think yeah, it's something sure. like German songs. Like I know about three words in German. Yeah, the, the <laughs> uh, a lead or a plural right. is like lead, lead there. Right, right. So how are you? Yeah, we, nobody know. judge me on my German here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were like from the 12th and 13th centuries. I mean, in song. And of course, every culture, I think, to some degree, um, had songs, right, as a part of their whatever traditions. Maybe it's something for a wedding or for a birth or for a baptism or for you know killing an animal on a hunt like whatever like there have been cultures that, that celebrate and they sing a certain thing that i think is music but it's also specifically a song i think music is just maybe broader you know writing music right. versus writing a song a song to me my interpretation of what a song is it has possibly a more like a like a, a form that's easier to catch right Maybe right. it's shorter. Maybe it's more repetitive. Maybe there's like an A B, A B C kind of a thing, right? Um, verses, intros, choruses, all those elements. Those are, of course, things that we think of in modern songwriting. But those have been going on for hundreds of years in Western music and Eastern music. Hmm. So a song to me is possibly more melodic, more maybe shorter, uh, more concise, um, possibly conveys one feeling or one idea rather than many a symphony is not a song a symphony is is music that's right. that's writing music writing an album is not writing a song that's writing various songs into one album right but that's all music you feel me mm -hmm. so my my take on a song i mean we could we could list an endless amount of songs right mm -hmm. uh but but do you feel I like mean, it has to be vocals for it to be a song uh song yeah no, no, I don't. I mean, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star mm -hmm. without the vocal is a song. Right. It's a piece of music, but it's not like a symphony. <laughs> it's not like Moonlight Sonata or, you know, Claire de Lune, which mm -hmm. are song-like, but those are pieces of music. That's a whole different thing to me. Um, and if you were to set lyrics to Claire de Lune, which I don't believe there originally were lyrics. I don't know if anybody has ever written lyrics for that song. But would that all of a sudden make it a song? I mean, I could call it a song just now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It's, <laughs> I don't know. These are just words, right? What is it? What, what do any of these words mean? They just mean what you want them to mean. So a song to you might be different from what a song is to me. As right. far as my music, like I said, it's all music. Um, and within that album, within that music, are elements of songs, if not just songs. I have a song coming out this Friday, that is a song. It is three and a half minutes long. It's called I've Been Waiting. It has a clear melody, a kind of ambiguous form. And I mentioned form earlier being usually kind of easily uh, easily catchable, if you will. Mm. Uh, but it definitely feels like a song. It doesn't feel like a symphony or an arrangement or a piece of music like we use these words to describe maybe certain things in the classical or jazz world, right? Mm. It's a song. Um, other things on the album feel more like, you know, art art pieces or right. one that has spoken word and it's only two minutes long and it's kind of crazy fast and there's not really a memorable melody that comes out of it and there's no real form. You get what I mean. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm somewhere in between. The second album that'll come out next year, I think, is much more in the song writing world. Like I said earlier, it'll have clearer songs, but uh, that's actually, I, I love that you bring that up or, or that we're focusing on this because that's something that I think is currently, but will eventually um, kind of distinguish my music from maybe the rest of the quote jazz world, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, because so much of jazz music, at least in the last 60, 70 years, has been, you know, longer you know, like seven to ten minute songs, songs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll take long solos and really stretch out on things in it. We've kind of lost an element of, well, song 
like character or you know the music that was coming out in the 30s and 40s <clears throat> in the jazz genre i mean really all popular music was jazz more or less right mm-hmm. in america yeah it's coming on the radio it was like we were listening to stuff that was swinging stuff that was two five ones i mean we <laughs> it's like it, it it was all commercial and and <laughs> oh where am i going with this <laughs> basically they they had this deep musical art form mm-hmm. but they would for for a number of reasons one being like the the technology not allowing them to record super long records right like charlie parker in the, in the club they would be playing you know 10 minute cuts of whatever they were playing they would just stretch out like we do but then when they went to make the record, they would make it two and a half minutes long, that song, right? It had a certain song-like feeling to it. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Even if it felt like a piece or just music or like more of a free-form composition, which very little of, the, of that music coming out on the radio did anyway, they would have found a way to package it up for better or for worse. I'm not here arguing that that's the better way to go. I, I would never say that. I mean, the music that's kept me up at night over the years has been Tchaikovsky. It's been symphonies, right? right, right. Uh, but there was a commercial element that a lot of jazz musicians these days either disregard or don't understand. And I think that song element is actually really at the root of that. Mm. So that's why I I love that you bring that up because I feel like that's something that I'm uh, very sensitive to and that I, that I'm all about. I'm all about the song playing the melody. (laughs) So you, you go into the, the more songwriting root now is is that a goal or it yeah it's not even a goal i mean it's already happening it's right, a reality right. I, just, I just like songs and i always liked songs and in a way i felt like the music i was first releasing so i've been putting out music for six years now uh, which isn't a whole lot of time um but there has been a pretty noticeable transition over the last two years towards that song element hmm. if you will but and, you think that's because of how society is today like that's where you're getting more pushed towards because it's so hard to release no. something else no, no i'm not really worried about society on any level where they're headed because right, right. society is always just going nuts it's always like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut off running around this is mm. what it feels like always mm. i think that people two thousand years ago would have felt the same way mm. I mean, that's what they were writing about. That's how Jesus was saying it was. Like, everybody was running around. They were all, you know, committing sin, whatever that means. Right. And, like, <laughs> the government was falling apart. And we think that, I mean, it's no better now. Mm-hmm. It's, maybe it's not any worse, but it's no better. Exactly. It's the same thing. I'm not worried about where society is going, where the music trend is or whatever. I'm just on my own path of musical expression. I think the reason why gone more towards songwriting because that's what i grew up with so i had this right. phase of like being you know, transcribing and i was studying music in school and so i was in a more conservatory mindset mm. that's what was coming out more naturally in my musical output i think as i've stepped away from that and i'm not in that grind so much i'm i'm more in tune with who i really am as a mm-hmm. musician and that'll continue to change <laughs> i think i'll just yeah. hope is that we get more and more in tune with ourselves, more more in tune with who we really are, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm going. That's, that's super interesting. Yeah, no, that, that's super interesting because, um, you know, because I feel I'm doing the same because I used to be uh, trying to write songs that were like very complicated, progressive uh, rock songs that was like seven minutes long and long stretches of psychedelic stuff. And now I can't be asked. <laughs> like, it doesn't interest me at all. Like, because I don't feel like I, I, I don't want to, there's nothing to prove. Like, I don't write music. I just write it for myself, you know. Um, I feel you. You know. So it's an interesting I'm, thing. I don't know if it's like a you thing where you start out, you want to show people, look at what I can do. and you know. A little bit. I mean, if you, you go back, you could go back and listen to the first stuff I was releasing mm-hmm. six years ago. And, it would, in many ways, it has most of the musical values or ideology that I've been expressing. It has that in it. It's just a little bit more 
uh, what I hear when I listen to it, other than just I, I feel that I'm a, a better musician in in the more I, I guess technical, but also maybe emotional, spiritual sense. But you know, besides hearing that I'm just you know six years of a better musician, I hear that to me it's clear that I was trying to do things because I was being influenced by other people or the world just a little bit more or professors or even records like heroes and idols of mine musically just doing well what do I think I need to do well that's that's not it it's not what you think you need to do it's what who are you what are you doing what do you feel mm-hmm. what is what do you actually want to do and a lot of musicians never even ask themselves that question they're like well I'm a jazz trumpet player so something in this vein is like what I should do well I don't see any problem with you being a if you want to you know, announce to the world that you're a jazz trumpet player and you want to gig and perform and record other people's music like that, but if you want to put out an album where you're just making video game music because that's what you grew up with, I have friends that do that. Mm-hmm. I think that's really genuine. Yeah, They're yeah, being true yeah. to themselves. Great horn players that play all kinds of great bebop, but the music that they put out now is video game music because that's what they grew up with. That feels like in a way their culture you know what i mean them and they and their friends it's like the whole life just playing video games hearing that music and wanting to do that do that so that's what i mean over time i think we get just more in tune with ourselves and and ho- hopefully right and we listen less to the world because in the end all of us are connecting with our favorite artists because they're really true to themselves or at least they're very individualistic mm-hmm. you know maybe maybe I don't know. Maybe some of these people who we think are are really deep, genuine, great artists are being told what to do. Yeah, and, you know, they're, they're <laughs> and labels are just totally manipulating them. I think some of them uh, experience that. But anyway, I'd like to think that most of our favorite musicians, the people that we really connect with, are being genuine and that's why we connect with them like we we feel that humanness in their music Mm -hmm. and you can get there everybody can get there you can get there at age 12 you can get there at age 22 it Mm -hmm. it, some people it takes them the whole their whole life to realize oh my i was always just doing things for other people and now i'm you know maybe they're ready then (laughs) to just be themselves man what does that even mean that's what i come Mm -hmm. back to it's like we don't ever really know who we are because we're constantly changing i think that's 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 definitely true that's definitely something and i guess you're the same here like because we keep changing our music we also keep changing you know that that's been very evident in in me i think um and then (laughs) yes here's the thing here's the thing is you know i was talking about how the music industry try we, we try to make it a ourselves a business we try to package things up and that's part of getting our music to people Mm. well it's clear that in the music industry what's most successful is a clear a brand right a clear brand and and consistent marketing consistency is key that's a business right and when you bring about change it has to be slow and careful and all that with pretty much every business you know this is why I think this is one of many reasons why I think art cannot really be confused with business because true art is in the moment is eternal it is spiritual it is emotional and it is constantly changing as an artist would change which means that you can never it's like trying to it's like shooting at a moving target right you should never really be able to get a you should never really be able to get the artist like right, if right. you know what i mean mm-hmm. like, the artist is changing man they're moving and and the the next album is different and it's mm-hmm. like you see a, an evolution over time but you don't really know man, I mean, it's, you, you see all these people like the pop stars they always look the same exactly like, i was gonna say yeah the haircut the same music now like here okay let's let's take somebody for example just because it's fun ariana grande an actually great singer and i say that because some of them are not, but mm. she's an actually great singer. I think she actually writes good tunes. And mm. we know or assume that she does the writing, uh, at least in part, herself. Mm. So mm. that's cool. Original artist, cool. Her music sounds different than the people's, great. Now, what I just noticed the other day is that not only 
are these people because you hear the songs on the radio and they all have the same four chords, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The minor six chord, <laughs> major four chord, dominant five, and a one. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have a two or a three chord, but it's mostly just those four chords. Same progression. Now that people are using the same sample packs mm-hmm. and like beat exactly. sounds and everything's the same. It's like, oh my, this is just nauseating. And then I noticed the other day, not only is that true, but with an artist like Ariana Grande, all of her songs actually sound the same as the other songs. Like she's not just trying to like not everybody. Not only is everybody trying to sound like each other and just, but she's trying to replicate her one. It was like Nike just deciding to put out the same shoe every <laughs> year, yeah. but like a different. Argue well, that is what they're doing exactly because they're a business, they're just trying to market you and sell you something. Mm-hmm. That's all popular music is. That's commercial, that's not art to me. That doesn't mean that she's not an artist, that doesn't mean she's not a fantastic musician. It's just that's the commercial business approach that I just feel like is actually antithetical to art itself. Mm-hmm. That's not art, mm-hmm. and yeah. I mean, that's a, I definitely agree with you. Um, it also reminds me of something that Frank Zappa said because I was just watching this new documentary about him. And he's also in the same vein, you know, if you I don't remember his words exactly, but it's something like if you let business come in to influence your art, your art will suffer. And I agree because what you're saying is what we are experiencing or what the, the pop culture is doing, has been doing for many decades, I think. But it, it's it's so annoying, you know, because the music sucks and pe- so many people love it. And, like you said, it's like selling the same shoe because people are comfortable. They know what they're getting. So why not just give it to them, you know? <laughs> That's fine. And you know what? There's some good tunes. Ariana Grande has some great tunes. There's some good tunes on the radio. There have always been good tunes on the radio. Mm. I think it's easy to look back on the past and go, oh, everything in the 70s and 80s sounded way better. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Just the stuff that sticks around in culture sounded better. Obviously, that's why it stuck around. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the good old days with like, you know, everything was just Queen and Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind, and Fire. No, the, there was so much nasty music going on. I'm 100% sure because my parents grew up in those decades and mm-hmm. they tell you, oh, yeah, no, everything sucked except the greats. And that's why we keep listening to the greats. And we right. just fantasize, we just romanticize the past like that. But do you think we have the any good new stuff, greats? Like, that, that's fine. Yeah, I'm we wondering. do. Yeah. Yes, I think I was just about to say the good right. stuff from right now is going to stick. And it's sometimes hard to see, well, what really is good stuff? Well, I can tell you the good stuff is usually not the mimicky kind of like following in the wake of all the trends. I think most of the stuff with all these trap hats, mm-hmm. you know, I think most of that's going to die out. I hope it does mm-hmm. pretty quickly. I think very little of that's going to stick around. I don't know what's going to happen to music. I don't have high hopes for the direction, like I said, <laughs> of society. Mm. But but what's going to stick around? <sighs> it's hard uh, to tell. I, it's hard to tell. I think like Maroon 5 will stick around. Right. You know what I mean? Mars will stick around. I think Taylor Swift will stick around. Ed Sheeran will stick around. Ed Sheeran is a great artist. Mm-hmm. He really writes good tunes. Mm-hmm. He can sing his ass off, really, really play the guitar. And he, I love his, I know that his image is not really having an image, but I, lo, I really love that, that he's just an, a dude in a sweatshirt playing the guitar. Yeah, I, I think that's just <laughs> super cool. Um, I think he'll stick around. I mean, he's the kind of guy that puts out a song and it's already like a legendary like wedding hit. Yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah. mean? People want the <laughs> Slater, people are like getting married to that, you know? Exactly. He'll stick around. Um, it's interesting to to speculate on what will stick around in like the hip hop world, I think Kendrick Lamar will stick around. Right, makes sense. There's no he will stick around. Uh, I just think a lot of these guys that just sort of like rise to fame with an album or a single even, and they're just their music is just so. It's just like everything else. It's just clearly a formula. They're mm-hmm. just playing the game. It's, that stuff's just not going to stick around. That's fine. Um, let's see who else sticks around. I mean, as far as, like, the really popular people, um, yeah, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of artists that, and I wonder, I think it was always like this. I think there's a lot of artists that just come into the picture for a few years and they make a big splash. But, again, what time and time again, what I think, you know, what, what they're lacking is <laughs> the real individuality. It's like they just don't... <sighs> 
you know, why do any of these great jazz musicians stick, stick out? It's because they sound different, but not different in a, just to be different. You know, you don't get a gold, you shouldn't get a gold star just for sounding different. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a certain element of like sounding within the right, right. ballpark thing just sort of has to happen for people to even know what's going on. But mm. and the people that really have a different thing to say, I mean, Adele kind of had a yeah, moment, definitely. who knows around. I mean, the thing is like, since if you're talking about the hip hop genre, because so many of them, you know, so many of them cannot sing like Drake. I mean, he cannot sing for shit yeah. and other similar yeah. artists, you know, I mean, it just, and also because they cannot sing, everything is so auto tuned. So there's no, there's no personality in the music anymore. If, you, if we're talking just about that sort of music, you know, and that has its own personality though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, continue. Yeah. No, 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 I'm just saying that that's what sometimes is driving me not insane, but just uh, become makes me annoyed. You know, because I think I guess you you are like me here is that we do like person like hearing someone's personality. You know, whether that's uh, playing an instrument or singing, right? Because I mean, we grew up listening to bands and artists where that came through, but today's in today's modern pop music world, that's not the case. And that's, that's a shame, you know. Part of it is the musicians, but I think part of it's also just the way music is heard and distributed these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just asked my 16 year old sister earlier. I said, I was talking about this second album really Mm -hmm. briefly with her that I'm planning to release next year. And I was like, do you think it'd be like, I said, okay, if you like an artist, would you rather that they released two, three, four singles like pretty close together before an album or just the album or one single? I was just giving her all these options. Like, what do you really want to hear? And she goes, you know, I, I don't follow anybody to that extent. Like, I don't, she, like everything I hear is, these are, these are my words, basically coming from a playlist Right. Or because friend, because every single friend you have is like, you got to hear the song. And then you're like, finally, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll listen. Right. Uh, or just somehow you hear something in like a TikTok video or on right. social media and you hear the bit of the song. You're like, oh, I should check that out. And then you listen to it. Or you hear a song on the radio and then you like it. So you download it. Right. Everything is one song at a time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now we know this, but now I'm like knowing it. Capital K. Right, knowing. right, right. right. Oh God, over the years, it's just hitting me over and over again. Oh man, people really just are going one song at a time. They're, they're barely even able to like conceptualize like an artist as an entity that like is creating albums and art and video. It's like, no, there's just, I heard this song and it becomes a little piece of your life, right? That's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's where we're at. So that is also having a huge impact on the way that artists are making their art. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that has to be considered uh, on our end when we're But so would you release your album in in a single, like per single basis or? Well, are you asking if I'm going to do that? Yeah, because because of this? Well, I started doing that for the first time in my life this year. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually put out a lot of music this year. So I put out two EPs. One of them was called My Favorite Tunes and that was in March. And it was a f- collection of five of my favorite jazz standards. And there was no singles for that. But then shortly after, I did another jazz standard with uh, friends of mine, Long Distance. We did a quarantine collaboration. That was kind of back when everybody was like, oh, this is this brief quarantine. Let's try to like make music mm. coast to coast or whatever. And now right. we're like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is just how it is. <laughs> we're recalibrating, right? Mm. But uh, I put that out. And then I did... I put out technically what is my first single from this album that'll come out in January, but I didn't know at the time necessarily that it was going to make it on the album. And that's a version of Stardust, uh, another jazz standard. So that's a total of seven songs, all jazz standards. And that's new for me because I was always putting out original music. So I started putting out these songs that everybody knows, or at least everybody in the jazz world. And that was three distinct releases. And then I did this Spanish EP where I put out two singles and then the four track EP. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six releases so far this year. The seventh was just two weeks ago with Once Upon a Dream, which was when I really officially announced that I had an album coming out in January. And then I have the new, the last single, 
coming out <clears throat> this Friday, mm -hmm. which will be, I mean, that's eight releases this year. Mm -hmm. All basically singles or EPs, like small projects, right? And that's the first time I've done that in my life, as I said. And I'm trying it because I'm realizing that that's how people really listen to the music. It's, it's a bummer because I want people to just have the album land in their lap and just digest it like it come on it's 40 minutes let's just put on headphones or speakers and really enjoy it but we rarely do that i only do that with a couple artists some of my favorite artists i'll do that with mm -hmm. and unfortunately i don't know if this is my attention span and i am working on kind of re-upping my attention span in the form of reading mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. uh but unfortunately i feel the same way a lot of the times the albums that i listen to it's like uh yeah maybe i'll just kind of listen to the first three and then go huh eh, eh. I'll, I'll check it out later, and then I'll listen to another one later. So, yeah, we're all dealing with the same thing. Um, it's just a cultural shift. The way that we listen to the music is very different, mm -hmm. and that's... Then you know, how was you don't the have results to... of releasing all those separate projects? Was it better than I'm, before? Yeah, they got more plays on, for sure. They, they've gotten more plays on Spotify and Apple Music than anything I'd put out in the past, because I used to just put out an album, mm -hmm. like, once a year or maybe once or maybe twice a year and just drop the album i'd do a little social media announcements and videos might come out but i never put out a single single <laughs> until right, right. Uh, this year i believe yeah so it's been new oh actually i put out an ep a, a different one last november too so really in the last year i mean that's a lot of releases mm -hmm. so it has changed it has up the numbers and the spins and the plays and all that um, it hasn't upped my social media following, right? right, right because right. that's separate. So yeah, it's interesting because just... I was talking to um, a guy called David Garfield the other week, uh, and he he doubled like he he has his own label and stuff, uh, and he doubled his stream from like a million to two by just releasing more music and some other stuff. But like what you said, like releasing more music tends to or it seems like it tends to drive up the place, which is really good. Yeah, yeah, Be for a number of reasons. So yeah. that's cool. So we got to just play that game. And <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> frustrating, but it's, just, it's no big deal. It's like, okay, people are listening. I have, you know, a lot of, um, I'm, just, I'm just incredibly fortunate to have the fans that I do, to have the audience that I do, and they're listening, mm -hmm. and they're, they're wonderful. And mm -hmm. they're going to listen to the album. Maybe it's because I put out several singles before, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Um But yeah, with each new project, we we have to just consider all the the, the, the yeah. factors, everything that's going in to or not. I mean, like, like, honestly, it's easier to just do your thing, mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be a selfish path. Mm -hmm. You know, releasing music just the way you want isn't. That's not just about you. It's because really, well, you're an artist, so just do it your way. Do exactly. your thing your story share your truth be genuine authentic and the people will come mm -hmm. if the music is good the people will come the people will always come they'll always find the good music because people share and when the music is good they'll share so yeah as much as i try to pay attention to all this <laughs> a lot of times i just go yeah whatever just yeah kidding. makes sense man i mean i got to ask you about <laughs> uh, jazz standards because that i feel like that's something that only exists in the jazz world like where you actually play uh songs from other artists and to sort of show people what you can is that the right interpretation of what you do with jazz standards or is there different meaning to them because I, I, i haven't seen it in other genres you know yeah it's a very strange thing actually in <laughs> in jazz genre but You have seen other genres, classical music. Hello, right, right, all right, the right. we're doing is playing covers. Right. It's actually very weird that they are almost exclusively playing covers. Like at least jazz musicians kind of switch it up, right? Right. Uh, that's for a number of reasons. I have never released jazz standards just because I want to make sure people know the song. Mm -hmm. I decided to do that this year at the beginning of the year because. I had a couple ideas for these arrangements and I was playing this weekly gig where I was playing this music in this fashion. And I was like, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Take a snapshot, if you will, of that moment in, in my life. And it was funny too, because that standards album that I put out 
in March. We recorded in February, and I had just had a few months of recovery from a tonsil surgery. Wow. So I was like really not even feeling that great physically. I think the music has this really subtle vibe to it that is cool. Again, we took a snapshot of that moment, and we can look back on that for the rest of the time and right. be like, ah, that was when we did that. And I think <laughs> in a lot of ways, that's all an album right. often is. It's mm-hmm. just a snapshot. We're constantly evolving. Great. Um, but why do we play the standards? I think sometimes people do it because they want to reach an audience and they want to play songs that people know. But I think the majority of the time, people are just covering standards because that's what they practice and that's what they listen to. Right. Jazz musicians are listening to Clifford Brown play I'll Remember April. That's not a song anybody knows. But we all hear Clifford play it and we go, man, that's nice. And so you make an album and you go, well, that's what I want to put on it because that's just what's in your head. That's what you practice. That's what you know. Right. Um, I'm different. I've always put out original music because I've always been writing music. Since a little kid, I was writing music. Even if it wasn't that great, I was always writing something. I kind of like to write music. I like to write poetry, too. I don't share much of it, but sometimes it ends up as a song lyric. Um, you know, we share what we want to share, but I've always been writing music, so that's why I do that. I think many people just put out standards because they don't write music, but they don't want to write right. music, or they don't feel like their music is good. And so it's what's in their head. They just put out what's in their head. I always and thought it, it had to do with showing showing people what you can do and to be compared with the greats, but that's not what it is? Well... <laughs> If that's your idea, you're 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 twisted. Right. You know, I mean, you're you're up. You're only going to be let down if that's the reason you're making music, and that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I know that you're I, you're right. There are people that are doing that mm-hmm. for that reason. They're recording standards because they want to show people. Well, see, this is how I can play over that same progression. Right. It's like, well, so what? That you you want a cookie? Like, what do you want for <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> you know, you want money? <laughs> nobody cares about that. Mm-hmm. Honestly, nobody cares. And when I say nobody, of course, some people do, but very few. Mm. It's really refreshing as a jazz artist myself to listen to a great, very individualistic voice, whether that's a voice or a horn or whatever, play their own rendition of something that I've heard thousands of times and really make a statement on it. That's very cool. But that only means something to me because I've already heard that song so many times. And very few people have heard those songs so many times. Right, right. That audience dying much faster than it is being regenerated of course there are young people that are growing up learning about this music but very few mm. um, whereas people in the 30s all they heard on the radio was george gershwin cole porter mm. we think oh that's so that's so cool i wish i lived in that time well it was just a different time and that's that now we're in a new time where everything we hear has trap hi-hats <laughs> yeah. and yeah i mean <laughs> most people uh well, I don't know where I, what gives me the right to say most people. I don't really know. But it feels like most people in this country, most young people that are listening to that stuff, really do like that. Mm. So they're going to be looking, maybe in 60 years, they're going to be sitting in the back of whatever theater being like, oh, this, this, like wanting to hear Trap or something. Like, oh, the good old days when we used to hear, where's that? Like, these young people don't know what they're doing. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, Crazy. yeah, yeah. But do you, but do you think that, like, with jazz, do you think that makes jazz not develop as it should? I mean, if that makes sense, because people keep referring to the old tunes. No, it keeps developing, but it's not developing because people are playing Cold Porter. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's not really helping. I think the music is developing because of original artists but that's all it's always been mm-hmm. yeah i mean you know like i mean I, I remember when i heard snarky puppy for the first time like that felt to me that felt oh shit this is jazz but they've added all these modern elements which was super cool like synths and whatnot you know that was pretty cool it, it's it is cool it's that's what makes the music evolve mm. it's just you know for anything to keep living it has to change mm-hmm. that's life life can change or synonymous you know what i mean or rather you can't have life without change so yeah to keep jazz alive it's got to keep changing so jazz isn't dead Mm -hmm. that old jazz is dead because it isn't changing because you can't change it like there's nothing like they had its time that's great 
it turned into be, honestly like Louis Armstrong's music turned into the swing era, which turned into out of that came bebop, which turned into a variety of things: cool jazz, modal jazz, hard bop, and then it went to like it went freer, then it got more druggy. Everything had a backbeat, kind of in the seventies, and and I feel like in part that was because the music had already evolved into this amazing r&b sound that was in the popular sphere and so jazz musicians were kind of looking at that and doing that with their music but it's it's alive the music is alive and, and well in many ways i mean we have jazz clubs closing down we're in a mm-hmm. pandemic people are hopeless but as far as the music goes it's alive and well as long as it's just evolving changing and exactly. just breathing you gotta breathe new life into it whether whether we're playing a standard or making an original album Mm-hmm. just breathing n- newness into it mm-hmm. um yeah because uh, uh mike um uh, who who i came in mm-hmm. contact with you he, he actually shared me uh your new album and i listened to a few songs today and i feel like there's a song i don't remember the name anymore uh but it's one of your songs and you sort of like um singing it's not rapping at all but you're singing fast over some yeah some jazz oh, beat. That's- Huh? <laughs> yeah that, that's 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 a, the, that's a very cool the, song the, man huh? the two minute yeah and you're calling it a song that was what i said earlier like we could call that a song but it's like a two minute moment where i'm delivering this spoken word yeah with, yeah, like, yeah, some, yeah and that that was yeah. super cool because that and that goes to say you know i felt like that you were, are then helping you know bringing something new in into the the jazz because i had never expected to hear anything like that song on the album so that yeah. was super cool well, I appreciate it. That was that's the idea, and mm. it's kind of a ten track trip in a way. Like everything sounds pretty mm-hmm. wildly different. And yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm hoping to breathe breathe new life into a hundred year old tradition. While also, I mean, I wrote I wrote eight out of the ten, right? So it's mm. it's compositional as well as just stylistic, mm-hmm. right? But I, but honestly, though, I'll, I'll say I I use the word try. I'm not really trying. At the end of the day, I'm just doing my best to flow and what comes out comes out and this album sounds the way it sounds like i said earlier a little bit like a musical Hmm. album that's coming afterwards sounds very different it's that's cool super groovy it's got a couple tracks with rap it's just a whole different color so and whatever then the next album will be something else and i don't i don't really care i'm not trying to be a, a fixed target I, I i like the idea of just moving about mm. and just shifting with people always say like changing with the times whatever the times my ass i don't, I don't <laughs> the times are just who even i can't keep up with the times. so i'm just changing with myself i'm changing right. and i'm changing upward i'm doing my best to be elevating uh constantly mm. just life and, and, and everything that i can and and just working on myself and just enjoying life and so the music is changing with this upward movement that i'm going through energetically and emotionally and it's a beautiful thing and Definitely. i'm excited i'm just excited for, next, for every project and every project that i get to work on with other people mm-hmm. uh, it's awesome man i mean definitely look forward to the album coming out so people can hear it um but also you know just before we wrap up maybe you can let the listeners know where they can find you at like Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, wherever they can hear yeah. your music and stuff. Those are great places. Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, just under your name, Tony Clausy, or yeah, yeah, just type in my name, Apple Music, title, all that stuff. Cool, man. <laughs> it's it's a wild world out there. What I would tell people, um, I think this is what every artist would would hope, is that you really listen with an open mind and an open heart and you listen on the best uh, sound system you can whether it's headphones apple headphones that's okay but just don't listen out of the butt of the phone right right, right. you know and when you watch a music video if you can put it on a big screen put it on a big screen you know what i mean i feel so bad for the people that are making films these days and everything just ends up for free on netflix and you're watching on a tiny phone come out of a out of a little speaker it's like come on yeah so uh yeah i appreciate every single person that's out there listening to my music i, I I hope that my music means something to them because it meant something to me when I wrote it and recorded it. And um, like I said, put on headphones, put on the speakers and just vibe out. 
mm-hmm. just experience the art. That's that's the idea. So Once Upon a Dream came out just a few weeks ago. That's the first single, like official single from the album. And um, this this song called I've Been Waiting comes out uh, this Friday. Awesome. So, and then the album in January, right? January 8th, yeah. Cool. Well, Tony, it was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much for out. having me. This is a blast. Awesome, man. Thank you, Tony, for coming on. Real pleasure talking to you and hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Uh, again, check out Tony's music. It's killer on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, wherever you are listening to music. Uh, also, feel free to check out the other tribe. Just enter your name and email address using the link below. Um, and then if you have joined the, the other tribe email list for free. Uh, you get exclusive access to interviews before the public a chance to ask guests, um, up-and-coming guests questions and much more stuff I hope we can do in the future like live streams and some fun stuff. Um, just having some trouble doing live streams, interviews. Don't really know how to work or OBS, I guess you've heard of OBS um, streaming service, but it doesn't really work properly with Skype. Some just lags and it's being really annoying. But I hope we can do some cool stuff like that in the future. Feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel and Apple Podcast, Spotify. It really helps grow the channel and it's growing slowly but steadily. Thanks to you. So I really appreciate your support. But that's it for this week. Pleasure having you here as always. And I'll see you soon. So take care. <laughs>